What is a hero without someone to save? Let's meet the inhabitants of Mario's Mushroom Kingdom, reimagined through speculative biology. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center. Today is Mario Day, and to celebrate we are taking a look at the Toads, those famous mushroom people from the Mario games. With their confusingly humanoid and fungal appearance, this will certainly be fun to speculate on. So please consider liking and subscribing if this concept, like a fungus, ends up growing on you. And now, without further ado, let's get started. We live in a world where enormous, tyrannical reptiles constantly try to expand the riches of their empires and in such conditions it never hurts to have a friend. And who can call themselves friendlier than today's research subject, the proud people that are the toads? Bophamicus maculata are a sapient species of very basal amphibians. They diverged from their relatives by growing larger and developing into a case-selected species, having fewer offspring that they could better take care of. During this process, the toads developed an internal metamorphosis, which reduced the risks faced by the amphibian larvae. Thus, the newborn would emerge already metamorphosed, a process that evolved convergently in other amphibians, such as Cecilians. However, despite their impressive size compared to other amphibians, the toads are still around the size of a medium-sized child, and have little defense against attackers, choosing to escape most of the time. Their main defense mechanism depends, instead, on their symbiosis with a species of fungi that grows on their back and head, in the structure known as the cap. This so-called cap is a hybrid structure, formed in equal parts of fatty tissue produced by the toad's body and of hyphae from their fungal symbiont. The hyphal body is woody and incredibly tough, acting as a mix of a defense mechanism and a fruiting body. The cap is highly visible and dotted with bright spots that attract the attention of potential predators or attackers. This ensures, if they attack, they will only hit the hardest part of the organism, doing very little damage to it. Upon being hit, the cap will also release spores, which are non-viable, and therefore cannot form their own hyphal bodies. They are, instead, produced only for the purpose of irritating potential predators and driving them away. And while the toads are not very strong physically, they are capable of running at very high speeds if pursued, releasing spores all the while. Given the reproduction method of these fungi, with viable fungal spores being implanted on the newborns from birth, the fungi can afford the energetic cost of producing non-viable spores for the sake of protecting its host. The fungal symbiont of the toads, interestingly, displays an incredible degree of variation in coloration, texture and growth patterns. This results from their phenotypic plasticity, the capacity of organisms to produce different phenotypes, or sets of observable characteristics, in response to environmental variations. Since the fungi grow on a medium composed of their symbiont's tissues, they will change their morphology depending on their medium's nutrient availability, genetic predisposition, and even their particular diet. This plasticity is expressed most clearly in the color of the cap and its distinctive spots, with the total quantity of possible variations being currently unknown. That said, there is also a distinct plasticity seen in the growth of shelf-like hyphal structures, which are mostly present in high nutrient conditions. These structures, however, are not vital for the functioning or survival of the symbiotic fungi, and so will often be cut and stalled according to the toad's personal preferences. Toads normally live in damp, dark places, 
building large structures carefully crafted to preserve and improve those conditions, where both the amphibian and the fungus thrive. However, there are populations that have made their homes in drier, more arid regions, and the variation presented by the toads has allowed them to adapt to these conditions with darker and more covering growths that help them block the sunlight. While the animal part of this symbiosis does not present the same degree of phenotypic plasticity, there are instances when high nutrient intake by the parents will lead to the birth of a toad with a special phenotype, characterized by a pink coloration, leading to its naming as a pichette morph. If this particular morph is fed highly nutritious food during its development, the symbiotic fungus may mature into a specialized phenotype it will grow into a much taller fruiting structure, becoming much harder in the process. This will not only give the toad a taller, more imposing stature which helps deter predation, but also a lightly protective armor around its body. While the body of the amphibian itself will not change as much, the increase in nutritional intake may lead to it becoming much stronger being particularly able to jump much farther and kick harder than its brethren. For this reason, toads born with this phenotype will often be tended to by others of their group and placed in higher positions as a sort of protector, their development being promoted by feeding them crown fruit, known for absorbing and storing a lot of nutrients as they develop. Most interestingly, Toads are very gentle and friendly despite their physical weakness, a result of their social, cooperative lifestyle, and they are known to quickly warm up to other creatures and outsiders as long as these are not a threat to them. There is even a story of a group of toads having adopted a lost baby and having raised it into their own society, eventually crowning her as their protector figure, or princess, in the absence of a more traditional protective phenotype. And that's it for a speculative biology look into toad. From what I've read, whether these are fungi or just weird little people has been a matter of discussion for fans of the Mario series, with Nintendo themselves confirming they are, indeed, fungal in nature. That said, I decided against making them fully fungal due to the fact that fungi are much less mobile than plants, which were used as the model for Pikmin. While plants have cells that can give them a certain degree of mobility, fungi mostly move by growing, which severely limits the chance for making them ambulatory. Hence, I decided to give them a symbiotic amphibian. An amphibian because, you know, toads. I did, however, base it on more basal amphibians, since the skeleton of an Anurans is too reduced and has too little space to adapt into something derived enough to look like a toad. Uh, like a Mario toad, not like a toad toad. I also decided to use fungal phenotypic plasticity to account for the absolute mess that is the variation in color and even hair they present since fungi are known to present very different colorations and morphologies when growing on different mediums or nutrient availability. In the end, I'm really happy with the end result, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Of course, here's a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode, especially to Kirboconosur17, whose suggestion for this episode really helped inform the final design. And also, Thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support our channel, and you get some nice perks too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe, or tell me in a comment which sport you'd enjoy playing with these guys. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.